Hello, I am Peter Okwacha. Welcome to Focus on Africa. Our top stories. The world's first ever malaria vaccine is rolled out in Kenya, where the disease is the biggest killer of children under five. Stop hurting our women. Hundreds protest in South Africa against the rising rate of gender-based attacks. Every day in this country, as a woman, we live in a, in a nightmare. Tunisians prepare to vote for a new president. They'll be choosing from 26 candidates. Also on the program, is the answer blowing in the wind? How Kenya hopes to become a global leader in renewable energy. And in sports, 800-meter world record holder David Rudisha has his sights set on a third gold at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Thanks for joining us here on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Kenya has joined the rollout of the world's first ever malaria vaccine, following behind Malawi and Ghana, who began the program in April. The aim is to add it to the routine vaccination schedule in the three countries. At least 300,000 children are expected to get the vaccine each year during the pilot phase. Dio Yusuf reports from Homa Bay in western Kenya, where the program was launched today. It is a heavy burden. Mothers, tired and desperate from losing their children to malaria. They have come here today because they heard some news of hope. An all-new malaria vaccine is being introduced in the country as part of a wider pilot program that aims to eradicate malaria. And it is just what these parents needed to hear. You may find at a time that our children are becoming sick and sometimes we are taking them to the hospital and finally, unfortunately, they, are, may, they may just uh, die. I've heard about the vaccine and I'm willing to take my child to this vaccine up to two years. Yeah, yeah all the doses. Malaria remains one of the world's leading killers, claiming the life of one child every two minutes. Children under five face the greatest risk. And Kenya knows all too well the pain caused by this disease. And that is why, when WHO called for countries to volunteer, it stepped up, together with Ghana and Malawi, to be part of this pilot program. The vaccine will be given as part of the routine immunization program to children in four doses, starting from six months, seven months, nine months, and the final dose at 24 months. Kenya aims to vaccinate at least 52 children a month to reach the WHO target of 360,000 children in all three pilot countries. The pilot will run for a period of five years, and once successful, it will be implemented in other countries. Shot after shot after shot. It is a checklist for all the vaccinations that children need to get from birth to two years old. But this time they need to add one more vaccination, RTSS, commonly known as Moscurix. Only this one targets the most killer disease in Africa, malaria. It is indeed an ambitious project and at this stage it still remains voluntary for parents to vaccinate their children. So how are the doctors finding the reception from parents? Uh, our parents actually they were happy but uh, they were just worried about the injection part of it. So they were feeling that hey, the injection, the immunizable conditions which are injectable are now becoming more but we explained for them they were now happy they are ready to take up the immunization. According to WHO, the new RTSS vaccine has been found to prevent malaria cases in four out of ten children between the ages of five and 17 months, as well as cut the most severe cases of malaria by a third. It works by training the immune system to attack the malaria parasite, which is spread by mosquito bites. For now, it is still at baby stage, but if the vaccine RTSS all works according to plan, it may just be the household name in the fight against malaria. Dayo Yusuf, Homa Bay, Western Kenya. 
Well, as you heard there, Kenya is the third country where this vaccine is being piloted. In April, it was piloted in some communities in Malawi and Ghana. Earlier today, I spoke to Dr. Richard Mihigo, a program area manager for the World Health Organization's Immunization and Vaccine Development Program. I began by asking him how well the immunization scheme was going in those two countries. Since the beginning of the program in Ghana and uh, Malawi, um, the vaccine implementation has been uh, um, going on quite smoothly. Uh, the vaccine uptake and the population are, are demanding the vaccine as uh, we were expecting. Uh, uh, and what's the uptake exactly? The vaccine, first of all, has been introduced into routine immunization program and the regular immunization program. And uh, um, the children are coming with, uh, along with uh, are requesting the regular other vaccines. And uh, we have not seen any sign of uh, um, drop in the vaccine. Uh, but on the contrary, in Ghana, for instance, we have seen a really a, a very good uptake of the vaccine and the mother families are requesting this new uh, uh, vaccine uh, uh, very well. Now, I understand that even when you do have this vaccine, which you have to take uh, four different times, uh, you still have to take other drugs along with it. Can you explain that to us, please? This vaccine is going to be one of the additional tools. Uh, in the prevention of the malaria. Um, it's going to continue to be uh, administered alongside with uh, um, uh, requesting uh, children to sleep under uh, uh, insecticide treated uh, uh, nets, uh, but also to uh, um, continue to, to use other preventive measures. So this uh, uh, vaccine is just a new arsenal in the toolkits uh, against uh, to fight against malaria. And, and in these tests and trials that you've done, how effective is it? Because I was reading somewhere that it is 40% effective. Is that figure correct? Uh, le let me correct something. This is not a test. This is not a trial. That uh, uh, Those countries have indeed introduced the vaccine in a pilot scale because we are trying to learn uh, how this vaccine could be in the real setting of routine immunization be administered. Um, it is a vaccine with a partial uh, uh, um, protection. Uh, you are right, uh, four out of 10 children that are receiving the, the vaccine are protected against uh, malaria. So it's quite important that we continue to use other additional uh, measure to uh, prevent uh, malaria disease. Let's take a quick look now at other stories making the headlines across Africa and the rest of the world. The family of the former president of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe, has agreed to bury him in the country's National Heroes Monument in around 30 days' time. The family and the government had been in dispute about where he would be laid to rest, with relatives wanting his body returned to his home village. Foreign ministers and defence chiefs from across West Africa are meeting in Burkina Faso to discuss a sharp rise in insecurity in the Sahel region. The delegates will review existing counter-terrorism initiatives and agree on priorities for a proposed emergency plan. There have been escalating attacks in Mali, Burkina Faso and Niger, despite the backing by a 3,000-strong French force. And there have been further signs that China and the United States are trying to de-escalate their trade dispute. Beijing is to exempt pork and soybeans from a further tax increase. The move follows a similar announcement last week by President Trump and comes ahead of the resumption of trade talks in Washington next week. Enough is enough. So say hundreds of women in South Africa who turned out to protest today in the country's, against the country's ri rising rates of sexual violence, murder and rape. The protests come in the wake of, of recent deaths of several young women, all acts of gender-based violence. National crime data released this week shows sexual assault up by 9.6% and rape up by 36 on last year. Namsa Maseko reports from the sit-in in Johannesburg. South Africa is a country facing a massive problem. Just yesterday, the government released crime statistics which have revealed that murder, rape and sexual assault have all increased. 
now. A recent spate of high-profile murders has got people asking, am I next? This protest is part of an attempted national shutdown which was organized on social media to highlight the issues of intimate partner violence and rape. I'm here because I'm sick and tired of what's happening. I'm here because I want my voice to be heard as well. I, I'm here because I'm also part of the women that were killed. I might still be alive, but I'm dead inside because every day in this country as a woman we live in a, in a nightmare. It's, it's not ending, it's a nightmare. It starts in the WhatsApp groups where guys share misogynistic you know, speak. It starts there and it starts at home and it starts in friend groups. And I feel like everyone needs to take action and really look at themselves, check their circles, check their privilege and use whatever privilege they have to fight for those voices that are not being heard. It's going to have to take, you know, our generation of, you know, the next parents and, 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 and uncles, fathers, grandparents, etc. to bring people up the right way. People here are angry, they want to stop the violence and they also want to see changes. But as things stand, the South African police are overstretched and are often accused of turning away victims who are desperate for help. It remains unclear how this country will tackle this very real and disturbing problem. More than 7 million Tunisians will head to the polls on Sunday to vote for a new president. The early election was triggered by the death of President Beji Kaid Esepsi in July. But while Tunisia is seen as a model of democratic transition since the Arab Spring uprising, it has been overwhelmed by economic and social problems, as Bassam Benoumi reports. 26 candidates from Tunisia's political elite are in the race. A former president, former prime ministers and ministers, along with party leaders, are taking part in the contest. Even the moderate Islamist party of Anahda, previously forbidden under Ben Ali's regime, has its own candidate for the first time. For political activist Chayma Bouhlal, change is in the air. Ten years ago, there was a lot of laughter when you talk to people about elections. They would laugh. There were not elections. And there was a lot of fear for certain people who were forced to participate in elections. Change is in the air. You can smell it. It can be scary. It can be a very funny feeling as well. But I think there's no comparison with 2010. In case no candidate achieves more than 50% of the votes, a runoff is scheduled for next month. Tunisia, where the Arab Spring erupted in 2011, was a spark for protests in favor of democracy in a tumultuous region. But the North African nation has been struggling to overcome major economic problems. In the streets, many are perplexed, faced with so many standing for election. And many are still uncertain. We need a sincere person. Those who exercised power before should quit. We need a president who is inclined to really take things in hand. The candidate should be competent, that's all. We hope that whoever wins this will be able to fix this country. This election has gripped the nation, but before the people reach the ballot boxes, its outcome remains remarkably unpredictable. Bassam Bounini, BBC, Tunis. Now, Nigeria has the highest number of registered missing people due to conflict in the world. That's according to the International Red Cross. Most of them are minors celebrated from their families during the decade-long insurgency of the Islamist group Boko Haram. In total, there are 22,000 registered missing people, but the true number is likely to be much higher. Our correspondent, Mayani Jones, has been to Borno State, the epicenter of the crisis, to find out more. Haunted by loss, Kabiru and Ashibi lost their son Shwibu five years ago when their village was attacked by Boko Haram. He was just nine years old. As she fled, Ashibi was faced with an impossible choice. I have a baby that was breastfeeding, that's why I had to leave him. The boy I was breastfeeding was crying constantly and Shribu couldn't walk, so I had to make a choice. If I wasn't breastfeeding, I would have carried him and taken him with us. 
More than half of those missing in conflict in Nigeria were under 18 when they were last seen. In the chaos that follows attacks, people lose track of each other, often ending up in camps like these. Disconnected and cut off, coming here to look for the missing can be their only hope. This camp is only a year old, but already 12,000 people live here. Some of them are waiting anxiously to hear the name of their relative being called out. They're hoping today is the day that they will be reunited with them. <laughs> there have been successes. These boys were found in neighboring Chad and reunited with their families in May. But these reunions are rare. Only 367 people have been found. It's also chaotic. Yamiram Ali Kwawu shed tears of joy when she heard her son's name. But she later discovered it was a cruel mistake. She's still waiting for news. The remoteness of locations like Monguno, close to Boko Haram territory, is another challenge. It's only accessible by helicopter. What is specific here in Nigeria is that there are so many no-go zones, so many people uh, living uh, in areas in which we do not have access, and therefore there is a whole body of the population which we can't reach. <laughs> Families like this continue to wait for news of Borno's lost generation. Maini Jones, BBC News, Borno, Nigeria. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News with me, Peter Okwache. Still to come, following in his father's footsteps as Eto's son is set to play for Cameroon. I'm Peter Okwache. The top stories this are... Kenya has launched the rollout of the world's first malaria vaccine. It's the third African country to take part in the scheme, following Ghana and Malawi. And hundreds of South African women have staged a sit-in protest in Johannesburg against rising violence against women and girls. Now, Kenya has recently launched Africa's largest wind power farm with hopes of becoming a global leader in renewable energy. Right now, 70% of the country's electricity capacity comes from renewable sources, and Kenya wants to be powered entirely by green energy by 2020. Emmanuel Gunza has been to the new wind farm in Turkana and sent this report. Welcome to Africa's biggest wind farm. These turbines at the Lake Turkana wind power project are slowly turning Kenya into a global and continental leader in clean energy. This farm, which costs more than $690 million, began operations in late July, backed by a consortium of African-European companies. Located in Kenya's northern region of Turkana, the farm has a total of 356 wind turbine generators. At full capacity, it will generate 310 megawatts of much-needed reliable electricity to the national grid. Just from the being the largest single IPP, renewable power, um, intermittent source of, power, of, of wind energy, um, it, it, it contributes about 17% of Kenya's power needs um, during the day, during peak demand, and up to 30% of Kenya's power needs um, at night of peak demand. This will also see the country end its reliance on fossil fuels. Well, the electricity generated here is already part of the national grid. It's already cut power outages by around 12%, and Kenyans can expect to have lower energy costs by between 7 to 10%. According to Kenya government plans, by next year, the country will produce 100% of its energy from renewable sources, including hydroelectricity, geothermal and solar power, and the potential here is huge. Already the country is Africa's leader in the geothermal sector and hosts the continent's largest geothermal plant here at Olkaria, northwest of the capital. With an installed capacity of more than 600 megawatts of geothermal energy, Kenya is well on its way of achieving its green energy ambitions by 2020. Despite this huge potential, millions of Kenyans like this ones have no access to electricity. The government has embarked on an ambitious project of connecting them to the grid and it hopes investment in mega energy projects on wind, solar and geothermal will go a long way in lighting up their lives and the country. Imanu Legunza, BBC News, Olkaria. 
You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. It's now time for some sports. Mimi, take it away. Thank you very much, Peter. We start with athletics. Olympic champion David Rudisha. He may have been off the track for almost two years, but he isn't done yet with the sport. The 30-year-old is set on defending his title in Tokyo next year. After telling the BBC he will go for a third gold. The 800-meter world record holder last month survived a car accident and believes it was a sign that he has more to accomplish in his career. I know, you know, uh, it's not easy. And of course, coming back from an injury, it's not always easy to get there. But uh, I'm, I'll try my best, as uh, I've been uh, always uh, doing, because I've been going through challenges, injuries in my career. But I've always been uh, coming out and, uh, you know, doing well. So I believe I uh, will prepare myself and see how best I will be able to come back. Now, there's been speculation over the past few weeks that African football legend Didier Drogba will run to be the president of his country's FA. The former Ivory Coast international has now come out and spoken at an event in his country. It's not yet clear if the 41-year-old will contest, but if he did, he still have to fulfill certain requirements to be eligible for elections. I think that there is work to be done. We have to listen to other actors in the game because I have not come to tell people I want to come back to the Football Federation because I want to be president. No, it is not like that. It is not like that. I want to be a leader with you, with you, who will take forward our football using a national vision. This weekend sees the return of the English Premier League after the international break. And today, Manchester City held their press conference ahead of their fixture away to Norwich. Pep Guardiola gave high praise to African football legend Samuel Eto'o, who announced his retirement from professional football. Both men haven't always seen eye to eye since their Barcelona days when Guardiola managed him for a season before selling him to Inter Milan. But Guardiola today spoke about the talent of the former Cameroon international. Incredible, outstanding striker. One of the best I ever met, I ever trained, I ever seen in my life. The personality, character, good quality, top score, more pressure, better performance. So, yeah, it was, a, it was a good honor for me to have him one season there in Barcelona. He was a top two player. And following in his father's footsteps, Samuel Eto's son, Etienne Eto Pineda, has been called up to Cameroon's initial squad for the Under-17 World Cup in Brazil. The 17-year-old is eligible to play for Spain, where he was born, but is now expected to commit to playing for his father's country, Cameroon. The striker is currently the captain of the Under-17 team at the Spanish club Mallorca, one of his father's former clubs. That's all the sport. Great story, eh? Absolutely. And don't just go yet, Mimi, because I plan to end Focus on Africa today with a marriage proposal. Oh, really? <laughs> don't not worry. in my mind. It's not to you. It's not to you. <laughs> don't worry at all. Uh, Nigerian pop sensation Davido has proposed to his longtime girlfriend, Chioma Roland. The artist, real name, David Adelik, it took to social media with several posts. The first was... Yes, sir! <laughs> That's right. The first was a video of the proposal which took place in front of a small crowd and lots of cameras. And then he shared a picture with the caption, she said yes, big rock. <laughs> the wedding itself is slated to take place next year. Good luck to both of them. Now, don't forget, you can get in touch with me and some of the team on social media. I'm at Okwache. But for now, from me, Peter Okwache, and the rest of the Focus on Africa team, have a great weekend and see you again next week. Goodbye.